Um, thank you all very much actually for coming and, and joining us for this session. I think we're in a great room because it's got lots of light and after so many fantastic sessions today already, I realise that you probably all just want to go and have a drink and a chat. Is that better? Oh, that's better. Um, so yeah, there's lots to discuss already from everything you've heard. Hopefully this pe session will inspire even more debate um, because it's a relatively controversial subject. There's lots and lots going on in this field um, that I certainly have learned a lot just having a quick chat um, in advance of this session and I thought I was pretty up to speed. Um, so we are conscious that we might be covering things that maybe are perhaps a bit more advanced than some of you are, uh, are aware of. So, you know, we are going to have plenty of opportunity for questions. If there's at any point you feel that you're a little lost in all of the jargon that can come along with this typical geekery, is that a word we can translate? Um, then, then obviously, you know, feel free to stop us and rein us in. Um, but I'm going to get started. I think there's a few people still coming in. I'm Jenny Sargent. I'm the managing director of First Draft. We are a coalition that came together last year um, of experts, I suppose, who focus specifically on social news gathering and verification. Um, I'm joined by my esteemed panelists, all of whom are, are kind of embedded in this field as well. So everyone has got uh, either themselves working on projects or they're very much sort of supporting projects that are happening in this space. Um, I think probably, <laughs> we've been joking about my inability to pronounce surnames, so uh, I'm going I'm to give it a go. Uh, to my immediate right is Jochen Spangenberg, who is from Deutsche Welle, uh, the innovation uh, project at Deutsche Welle. And he also leads the um, Reveal project and a new video verification project called Invid. Then we have Sam Doubley, who is my colleague at Eyewitness Media Hub, um, a co-founder and also formally, and I need to check my notes to ensure I get this right, head of Eurovision News Exchange at the European Broadcasting Union. Um, then I think we have Doug Arianis, uh, who is the co-founder of Source Fabric. Sorry. Uh, yeah, co-founder and director of innovation at Source Fabric. I'm aware I'm not doing this very well with the microphone. Um, and Mark Stencil, finally, who is the co-director of the Duke Reporters Lab and wanted me to introduce him as a fake professor of real fact-checking. Um, so, luckily, that's my bit over with the surnames, and I'm actually now just going to hand over what we felt was, would be a good way to kick off this session. Um, because automation can be a bit of a dirty word in journalism, we want to start by demonstrating the opportunities around automation, get you all a bit more excited about what's possible. We will be coming on to some of the challenges later on. So I've asked each of the panellists just to kick off with a five-minute introduction to their work, what's on the horizon in future, um, and some in, uh, projects that have inspired them or interest them, so to give you an overview of this space. So we'll start with Jochen. Right. Thank you very much, Jenny. Great to see so many of you in here. So we are delighted to be here talking in front of you over the next hour and a half, so we hope we won't bore you. So I was just asked to give you a sort of very quick introduction to the topic, and then, as Jenny has just said, get into the details of we at Deutsche Welle Germany's international broadcaster, get up to, and then my colleagues here on the panel will continue. And as, as Jenny said, lots of opportunities for you to ask your questions, get involved as well. One of the issues we faced when we were preparing this was we weren't fully sure how deep everybody is in the topic or so. So I'm, I'm, let me just start with a sort of setting of the framework. What you see there, oh no, I'm clicking, aren't I? Why do I have to? Somebody else clicked, that wasn't me. Um, so I've just prepared these three images or so just to set the scene. And if you look at the, le the left one, yes, the left one, that's, I find, is an almost iconic image, an image that was taken in 2009 when that plane, the US Airways plane, landed in the Hudson River. It was taken by a guy called Janus Crumbs, um, who was on a commuter ferry. And then he took this photo, not very high quality, but he was the only person around who took this photo, shared it via TwitPic on Twitter, and then it made the rounds, was passed on, it was just published on traditional print papers, on online portals, and so on. So it is one of those yeah, iconic images that clearly show that there's a, a huge value, a tremendous value in user-generated content, or when you see EM, 
eyewitness media, some people call it citizen media, so I use them synonymously. So there's a tremendous value because very often when news breaks, when information takes place, there's not necessarily journalists at the scene of the event, there's just ordinary people with their smartphones taking photos, as you all know. Then the middle one, I'm just getting a bit sick of shark photos. Um, so I've <laughs> selected this one, whale in Venice, and since we're in Italy, um, yeah, it's one of those categories, too good to be true, um, but you could also do a quick analysis and image um, search and would find very quickly that this is a manipulated photo. It gets a bit more tricky when you come across vi video sets in this case on the right-hand page. There's so many issues. We could have a session on this video alone. I don't know who is familiar with that video, who has seen that video. There's quite a few. Well, it happened only a very short time ago. It was Brussels, the attacks or the bomb explosions at this one at the airport. So I'm sure I'm going to get the name wrong, but it was a lady called Anna Arenheim who posted a video or this video saying explosions at Brussels airport. And it was shared when I looked about after an hour again, over 20,000 times. Then there was, I did a count after an hour and a half and about 63 news organizations contacted her via Twitter directly asking her, can we use this video? Um, and there's a lot of, uh, has been written about it and, and other places, and uh, I'll leave that out, but there's also a publication by Sam here or something he translated. Um, so there's something that has to be dealt with. It later turned out that she didn't take that video, it was passed on to her via a WhatsApp group and she just posted it. And the originator of that video is a guy called, I have to look, what's it, Kopfer, Kopferstein? Can somebody just look and tell me the name of the gentleman? Uh, Pinkas Kop Kopferstein. He was the originator of the video. He took it, but he wasn't attributed with it for a long time. So there's ethical issues because lots of organizations didn't even inquire about the safety of the person. It is an accurate video. It, it, it is portraying what it's supposed to be, but there's a number of issues revolving around that. But we come to that in the discussion. So if, who's flicking? Am I flicking now? So let me just, uh, here just now get into some of the actual things we are doing um, in this sphere, in this, in this um, s yeah, sphere. We are participating in a number of research projects, and that's research projects, meaning there's prototype development, we're trialing out things, we're testing things that all deal with verification. And one of these projects is a project called Reveal, where we're looking into automation, also the topic of today's session, what can be automated, what or where can algorithms help in the verification process? How can it support journalists in their work? And there's two use cases, one dealing with journalism, the other one with an enterprise scenario. And one of the ideas and aims of that is currently if you're working with user-generated user content, there's so many useful tools out there, but they're all sort of standing in isolation, lots of island solutions. And one of our aim so is bring, bringing that together. And I've just got uh, prepared here a few um, screenshots so you get some idea. So there's two parts of what we're aiming at. One is, and I can just point out on the left hand side, there is, and that's my personal view and opinion, there's always going to be a human element and there's collaboration part where people co collaborate, communicate with each other, share information, pass on information, but there's not that many really useful solutions for that but it's important to have that so people can work collaboratively on tasks like getting, yeah, getting to the bottom of things like a video or so. But then the other part we we're trying to integrate is algorithms, technical solutions that take over particular parts of the job. Looking at images, for example, verifying images, giving clues, giving clues about a contributor, and that's what you see at the bottom. We sort of split that up into the three Cs, which is contributor, content, and context. And each of these individual items is then sort of investigated further. On the one hand, by just um, accessing existing tools, for example, um, TinEye for image similarity retrieval. And on the other hand, where we are developing our own tools, and that's what you see on the right hand si side, that's sort of more on the rocket science area, where some of our partners are working on algorithms that detect fakes and manipulations in images using a variety of algorithms and technologies. Oops, now this one. So just the final one here for my final slide and then I hand over. Another project we are involved in, and this one has just started, 
is called INVID that started in January this year, and that is tackling now the, at the moment, still quite challenging task of um, automating the video ver verification process, and it, that is really quite some challenge. There's a few tools and services out there that aid in the process, but still at the moment, it's still largely uncharted territory, unlike in the image verifications here. And I've just got a quote here from a guy called Christoph Kettel, who is working for Amnesty International, and they provide some uh, very useful tool there. And Christoph is writing in this publication here that just came out recently, and I quote, looking at the massive number of videos related to the Syrian conflict, and it relates to other things as well, the human rights community, in brackets I say now, also referring to journalism, currently has no suitable tools at its disposal to review, analyze, and most importantly, connect all these videos in order to an identify patterns and trends. So this is one of the challenges we are tackling here. And there is a lot of work out there that needs to be done. And yeah, we're trying our best to make little contributions there. So I hope I didn't overspend my time and hand over to Sam now. Okay, thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, about a year and a half ago, I think, wasn't it? We were, Doug and I and some other colleagues and a colleague of ours, Sam Stewart, were sitting at the ONA conference in Chicago talking about just these problems. And we kind of realized that regardless of anything, regardless of how much we talk about verification and the simple steps of verification that need to be done on social media content in conferences like this, time and time again, every time there's a major event, a scandal, uh, a terrorist attack, a natural disaster, time and time again on social media, Twitter, Facebook, etc., we're seeing the same content re-shared, re uh, problems, uh, content being shared on Facebook, on Twitter. I'm sure you saw, for instance, you know, the, the Eiffel Tower being lit up green and white in memory of the victims of the terrorist attack in Lahore which was actually from the Rugby World Cup in France in 2007. And time and time again, regardless of how, how much we talk about this, it keeps reappearing. So we asked ourselves the question of, what if, when this content comes into the newsroom, some automatic tests, the tests that are already out there, like Jochen mentioned, TinEye, Google Image Search, the EXIF data contained in photographs, so the, the data on every picture you take with your iPhone, or your smartphone contains a certain amount of data. What if that could be extracted and then presented in a useful way? And that's kind of how we came up with the Verified Pixel project. Um, if I could just have the slides back, please. Thank you. Um, so the idea behind Verified Pixel was to build a prototype which put all of these tools that are readily available that are talked about in the verification handbook, for instance. So if you are interested in verification, I strongly recommend you look at this. Uh, in one interface so that time, every time an image comes into a newsroom, into a human rights organization, anybody who's interested in verification, these tests are run in a standardized manner to give the journalist all the information that's freely available at their fingertips. Um, so the question is, as you know, Jochen showed the picture of the whale, we have, I, have a, I have two shark pictures. <laughs> <laughs> one of a shark jumping at a helicopter, other of sharks, I guess in Hurricane Sandy, I think. So how can we trust what we see? Um, you know, so much is going around. We have a picture of Romney and money and pictures of, you know, edited faces out of golfing pictures and that kind of thing. How can we test if these are, these are actually real or not? Um, so what we can extract from things like ex EXIF data, for instance, is where and when the photo was captured. But not many people know that. What kind of camera was used? Not many people know that. What were the camera settings? What was the file resolution? Each camera has its own pixel, pixelation number of pixels that, you, that is used in a picture. Can we present that information in a useful way for a journalist to then make a decision about whether or not to use a picture or not? Has a photograph appeared online before? Um, is a photograph an original camera file? I.e., has it been taken from somewhere else and then shared? Or it, are you actually dealing with the person who actually captured the image uh, and shared it? So in terms of how Verified Pixel we set it up to work was, you know, there's an ingest of the, of the picture, of the photograph, into the, the uh, Verified P Pixel system. All, all the tests are then run, and then you're presented, your newsroom is presented with those results um, 
as the picture comes into verified pixel. So you can't receive a picture without actually also receiving the results. Um, so, of course, live demonstration is always very dangerous, so I wasn't going to attempt a live demonstration with this Wi-Fi. Uh, but here's some of the screen grabs from what we do, what you see with verified pixels. So there we have a picture that was taken uh, in, in Boston, I think. Is that right? Yeah, yeah in Boston. Uh, you can see on the left-hand side of the screen up there, uh, it pulls out a, a map to show you exactly where in Boston the picture was taken, which you can then uh, cross-check cross with the image to make sure the landmarks are, very, are similar to actually check that it's actually where the phone says the, the picture was taken is actually what you're seeing in the picture. It tells you the type of camera that was used, the, the ISO, the speed, the aperture, and so on and so forth, allowing, presenting that information in a way that's very easily readable. At the same time, um, it helps you, we can see actual landmarks. This is a street view for comparison. And then we have the reverse image search. And some of you may have seen that picture going around when MH370 disappeared. Uh, it's actually a screen grab from Lost, the TV program Lost. And then someone photoshopped Malaysia Airlines onto the, onto the fuselage of the plane. Very quickly, verified pixel would present that image with, again, on the left, uh, showing you that it's already appeared on the internet. So it runs a tin eye and Google image search so you actually see it straight away, avoiding you doing that kind of sharing of content, which is actually misattribution or a misrepresentation of what happened. Also able to, uh, from examples of from actual news events, so used in, in pictures coming from the Ukraine, from Nepal in the earthquake, and the refugee crisis in Hungary. Again, actually using the EXIF data, street mapping, to actually show, where that, show whether the actual picture it was taken. So, um, so many pictures out there, so much content flooding into newsrooms, teams that are smaller, uh, ver UGC verification teams are either smaller, getting smaller, or very few people involved in the process. And then actually having this consistent time and time again, the same tech checks run every time. And that's the one advantage we see with automation and verification. The same tests are run time and time and time again. That means that you're not going to forget to actually do those tests. And you're presented with the information uh, that you can then make your decision from. So that's a brief overview of what we try to achieve with Verified Pixel. Obviously, I think more will come down into our discussion. But I'll hand over to Doug. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, along with Sam, uh, the developers at my organization, Source Fabric, uh, worked to uh, create the Verified Pixel platform and actually to write the code. So, uh, just a quick show of hands: how many developers are in the room? Okay, uh, the Verified Pixel project is up on GitHub, and so you can already uh, go and see what the source code is there. Um, so. My organization, Source Fabric, makes specialized tools for news organizations. And what I wanted to show instead was uh, not necessarily our own tools, but I want to point out a few of the things that I think are really interesting in terms of things that are here today that we can actually use. Um, so if I can have the slides back, uh, one of the things that I wanted to show, uh, can I have the slides back, please? Hello? Yeah, thank you. Okay, um, is it this one? Right. Yeah, that one, okay. Ah, okay, um, probably every time you guys have uploaded a photo to Facebook, you see that uh, Facebook will ask you, they'll detect a face, and they'll ask you, who is this person? Um, the, the recognition of faces is one of the areas uh, that I think is most interesting uh, right now. Basically what's happening in the long-term trend is that we're teaching machines to see. Um, so that in the, in the example that I'm showing here, uh, the face de detection works now well enough to determine that this is a human face and it's not the face of the stuffed animal. So that the machine now knows the difference between the human face in the photograph and the stuffed animal. So in this way, the, you know, when for example, an image is uploaded, then we can detect where the human is in the photo. So that, I think, is an important, uh, an important area. 
Um, this is a, a service uh, offered by Google now uh, called Cloud Vision, um, the Google Cloud Vision API. And the Cloud Vision API has a number of different uh, interesting functions, and we were talking about this this morning um, in terms of uh, even detecting, basically you can teach it to look for certain things, and then it will give you the results back. So here's another example of that. Uh, this is a, a tool from Google called Inception, uh, combined with a, a machine learning algorithm called TensorFlow. And what you basically do is, with this one, you feed a whole bunch of different images into the system. And the system then says, okay, this, if you tell it, this is a salamander, right? So you can train it to say this, okay, this is a salamander. But as you feed more and more images in, it learns from every time you add a new image. So the example that we've got here is that the system now can tell the difference between these two very similar types of salamanders. Uh, the one on the left is a spotted salamander, and the one on the right is a fire salamander. Now, I don't know this, but this system, because it has been fed this type of information, can then say, to, can tell the difference. Now, where I think this can be applied is in the area of traumatic, uh, potentially traumatic inf uh, images or uh, the, you know, the kinds of gory things that we're seeing from any number of different uh, conflict zones. For example, in Sam's research, one of the things that he's been saying is that the element of surprise is one of the things that is most traumatic to people. So that you, you know, you're seeing a bunch of happy images and then all of a sudden something comes into your, your Twitter feed that is completely uh, gory and, and awful. And that has more of a traumatic effect than if you are sort of able to prepare yourself to see something gory. So in this way, we can teach an artificial intelligence system to say, here are gory images. Warn me before you show me these so that the, the social media editors then can be sort of, they can have time to prepare themselves for uh, seeing things that potentially would, would traumatize them or even give them more lasting uh, mental issues. So this, uh, this inception and TensorFlow, I think, is very interesting in that, in that area. Uh, I wanted to give a shout out to a guy by the name of Justin Seitz, um, who is one of the people, he's a, a software developer, uh, he is working with the project called Bellingcat. Um, he has a blog that I absolutely recommend reading if you're interested in this topic called Automating OS Int. Uh, OS INT stands for Open Source Intelligence, um, and he has a number of very interesting how-tos in how to use these types of automatic, uh, these automated tools for journalistic purposes. So one of the things that he did, and this is a fascinating post on his blog, uh, using, about using uh, these machine vision techniques to identify certain types of weapons used in conflicts. So when you see one of these guys waving this gun, what kind of gun is it, right? Because that also can help to tell you who supplied those guns, where are they from? And you can learn more about a conflict and the nature of the conflict simply by identifying the guns in them. Um, this is just one example of these, uh, these types of uh, techniques that can be used today. Now in the post that he, uh, is, uh, that he has about this, one of the tools that he uh, recommends using is a tool called Imaga. And what is really interesting about Imaga is that, again, this is uh, machine intelligence or auto-tagging, so that the system will, you give it an image, and then it comes back with a number of different tags saying what the computer sees. So in this case, we have this picture of a laptop. And in the middle, all of those uh, those things in the bar, uh, the bars, the, the tags that are that this is what it's seeing. So it sees monitor, laptop, computer, screen, notebook, all of these words, these textual words, it is able to see from the photograph that's been submitted to it. So in the same way, what he's doing is he is using Imaga. He feeds it an image of a gun, and Imaga comes back and says, "Oh, that's a Kalashnikov." 
right? Or that's this other, you know, that's an uh, uh, AK-47 or whatever the gun is that's being used. So this I think is really interesting as well because this is where, where this, this type of work is headed in a lot of ways. A machine that is able to see will also be able to provide uh, verifiers with a lot of information that they would have to uh, normally do by hand, which takes a lot of time and takes a lot of effort. So I think that these are some very interesting areas that are being uh, worked on today and that are uh, worth your attention. Now, what, uh, what Sam mentioned that we did with Verified Pixel was that we were able to tie together a whole lot of different services. And each of these different services has what's called an API. An API is like a way for one computer program to talk to another computer program. And so we're able to make connections now between all of these different APIs. So for example, if you guys use a, a tool like for the iPhone called if then then if this then that or IFTTT, all it's doing is talking to a bunch of different APIs. So the concept that we're, we're using here is relatively straightforward now. What's interesting in the journalistic context is that we're now able to mix and match all of these different services and then put them together uh, for verification purposes. So the last thing that I wanted to show you is a project from the University of Indiana uh, called the Truthy Project. Now Truthy uh, is making reference to uh, Stephen Colbert's uh, joke, the, the American comedian Stephen Colbert, who says, well, you know, I don't know if this is true or not, but it sounds truthy. So uh, what they're doing with Truthy is they're also creating a whole bunch of different services uh, that automatically will help to tell you whether something is b believable or not. So the first tool that the Truthy Project uh, came out with is something called Bot or Not. So when you see something on Twitter, how reliable is it as a human? Uh, and what it's doing is it's running a bunch of different automatic tests to say, okay, this person has a bunch of posts. They have, uh, the posts are about these, uh, these different topics. Uh, the emotions expressed in those posts are positive or negative. Um, and so they're doing some sentiment analysis already of the words that you're posting on Twitter. So in this way, what you're able to do is you're able to see if uh, the, the, the Twitter user is a legitimate human being or if it's a bot, if it's, you know, for example, from the Kremlin bot army or from other uh, interested parties that are interested in distorting uh, information. So the Truthy Project and especially Bot or Not are things that I would really recommend checking out because this is a great uh, example of automation in action. So with that, I'll hand over to Mark. Hello to the folks who can't see me around the corner of the monitor here, but my apologies, but I know you're there. Yep. <laughs> Oops. Um, so I am from, uh, from Duke University in North Carolina. I am uh, the co-director of the Reporters Lab there, and what we do at the Reporters Lab is we study, one of the things we do there is we study fact-checking, and you're also in the truthiness business. Um, and what we are specifically looking at is the spread of fact-checking uh, as a journalism concept. Uh, we currently track more than 100 active fact-checking projects, uh, uh, mostly <coughs> affiliated with uh, journalism institutions around the world. Uh, and then we also study the, the impact and effectiveness of fact-checking. Um, and uh, one of the things about the impact of fact-checking is the way that we do this process is very laborious, journalistically speaking. It has a lot in common with the kind of verification techniques that we've been talking about so far on this panel. It's slightly different. We're, we, you know, we're not, it's a different, generally this is a different form of accountability and verification. We are, for the most part, uh, a community of journalists and, uh, and researchers who are looking into the authenticity and veracity, the truthiness of what public figures say, politicians, media organizations, holding large institutions to account for what they say and the accuracy of that. But 
there's a lot of information that comes out of those organizations. They have a lot of data at their fingertips. That data is easy to misrepresent. Figuring out fact from fiction is as me in many ways as hard of, as it is to figure out whether the picture of the plane in the uh, Hudson River is real or not. Um, and so last week at Duke, we convened a panel, uh, well, a group of 50 academics, uh, computer scientists, journalists who are working in this field to get together and compare notes on some of the projects that they're doing. Um, <coughs> one of the things we talked about a lot at that session was what my colleague Bill Adair, the founder of PolitiFact in the United States, uh, often describes as the holy grail of fact checking. Um, and I don't particularly like that term quite as much as Bill does because the holy grail is sort of more mythological, so I prefer to think of something uh, a bit more real. Um, and just since we're talking about verification, in fact, I should point out this is a real image from the moon. It actually did happen. I know some people don't believe it. We have verified it. Um, but I, I, we, I like to think of what we're, we're shooting for is a bit of a moonshot. Um, and it's not going to be the kind of moonshot that Jules Verne uh, imagined in the 1860s where there literally was a giant cannon that sent people to the moon. It is going to be an incremental process where um, a bunch of developments and a bunch of research comes together um, a small step at a time leading to a giant leap that allows a lot of cool things to happen. So an example of one of the small steps that we're working on right now, um, the reporter's lab has uh, helping some researchers at the University of Texas in Arlington, Texas, uh, with a project called Claim Buster. And Claim Buster uh, analyzes text, and uh, this algorithm, this, this process has been trained well enough to figure out what actually sounds like a factual claim versus other kinds of rhetoric that might appear. So in this case, we took a speech from, uh, that Hillary Clinton delivered while doing a campaign stop in North Carolina a couple weeks ago. And as it happens, my students are, are writing fact checks based on this speech and this appearance. And the fact check that they're doing, just by coincidence, the one I chose myself journalistically to assign to them, <coughs> turned out to be the exact same claim that the algorithm picked out as the most fact checkable statement in the entire text of the speech. Um, I didn't know that when I ran it through there last night, uh, but the students had already had the assignment for a week. Um, it's possible the technology peaked at my homework, uh, but I don't think so. Uh, so this is a, what this means for fact checkers, if, if I'm working at Pagella Politica, if I'm working at Full Fact, if I'm working at PolitiFact or factcheck.org, I have such a tidal wave of information coming at me all the time. Finding checkable claims, finding things that are, are important, interesting, verifiable, factual statements, the kind of st statements that fact checks can zero in on, is a lot of work. What this does is accelerates the process by which I can sort out what's worth writing about, what's worth doing reporting on, what claim is most interesting, most useful. And it turns out uh, that there are a great many other computer scientists and journalists and fact-checking organizations themselves that are all working on different parts of these problems and trying to take them apart. Um, some of you will surely take a picture of this slide and post it on Twitter, which will be very helpful. Uh, you can also find, there's a Storify about our meeting last week at Duke. Um, there, is, uh, there are articles on the Reporters Lab and the Pointer website. The Pointer Institute hosts, hosts the International Fact Checking Network. Um, and so that's another place where you can go and find links to all of this research, all of the people who are working on these projects. Uh, Full Fact in the United Kingdom is doing some very cool stuff on their own. And uh, hopefully we'll be talking about that at a fact checking panel tomorrow morning in this room at 10 a.m. So you can hear more of that directly. Um, but there are researchers at Duke, at University of Texas, University of Michigan, at Google, at uh, the IBM Watson Project, who are all doing those bits and pieces that are going to ultimately get us 
uh, to that moonshot. Um, one of the things we came away from this conference with was a kind of a sense of shared goals and purpose. Uh, and we are building a bit of a community among these researchers and fact checkers to sort of keep this moving. Um, the kind of work that's being done falls into a, a series of categories. It really basically boils down to you have to identify the claim. You have to figure out what's worth checking. There's a lot of stuff out there in political rhetoric land. What's important? You identify the claim. You can track the claim. Where did it come from? Where did it originate? What's the basis for it? How has it been spreading? If it's misinformation, where is it spreading? Who is spreading it? Um, you can check the claim. There is some great, some of what the full fact people are doing is figuring out great ways to automate the process by which you can verify claims being made, not just identify the claims that need verification. And then ultimately the real goal, the moonshot, the holy grail, is to intercept those claims which is to get in the way of that misinformation. And the way we sort of imagine that happening is you're watching that political speech on television and the alert pops up and says, that thing that politician just said, that's false. Here's, here's information, more information on that. Your, um, or alternately, you have seen some political information from a political source and you decide you're going to share it on social media and your social media intercepts you and says, that thing you're about to post, by the way, that's false. Are you sure you wanna share it? There are different ways to intercept it. There are different strategies. We're really interested in all of that and how to get better information to the public and keep misinformation out of the public discourse. Um, as promised, just super fascinating. Um, and I hope that that's kind of inspired you all as to what's possible and so that you no longer hate the word automation when it applies to journalism. Um, my, my contribution is this highly technical visual verification guide. And it's sort of, I mean, half joking, it goes to demonstrate how much in need of an automated tool we are. Because at First Draft, we created this handy booklet, which is available on firstdraftnews.com or you can fold your own here, because I couldn't do enough on the plane. But uh, <laughs> you'll see these scattered around Frugia. Um, and the reason I joke about it is because we honestly couldn't come up with a more efficient way of demonstrating all of the checks that are necessary to verify a piece of content, particularly visual content. So you know, um, any video or, or pho uh, uh, photographs or images that, that emerge online, there's a series of checks you need to make. And in the booklet, we go through a sort of traffic light system to demonstrate that there's no black and white. So you'll go through maybe five checks for each piece of content, which is your standard who, where, when, what, why, but applying to verification. Um, and we hopefully, we're hoping to make a Chrome extension of this, but I don't think that's quite good enough, actually. And I think all of these different steps and the five checks for each who, when, where, what, it's so complicated. It, it, it gives you 25 processes that you have to go through and how realistic is that in a newsroom really how realistic is that in a breaking news situation that you'll reach for our handy guide and walk through you know i i'm not being flippant it actually is genuinely very useful but uh what would be great is if we can somehow turn this into or we can automate elements of this process so the reason I mention this is because Verified Pixel, I think, came closest most recently to trying to pull this into, into a one-stop shop. And I'm interested to hear, probably from Doug to start off with, how realistic it is to fit all of these processes into one tool. Is that what we're aiming for, or are we aiming to develop more and more and more that have been highlighted today? Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, uh, there are a lot of these services um, that have uh, APIs. And if you have an API, then an API can be joined together. Uh, now you can either put that into a sequence, like do these checks first, and then when you're done with those checks, then do these other checks. Um, you can also just do them all at once and then present the, the results to the, to the user. What was interesting about what we found with Verified Pixel was that uh, a lot of the, the, the issues have to do with how the information is presented to the journalist. So the question is just as much a question of, of visual uh, <coughs> user interface as it is going out to all these different services and like you know asking Google, hey Google, have you seen this image? And Google says no. 
Um, that kind of thing can be presented to a journalist in, in a pretty simple way, but that's a challenge for designers, especially as if you have like a hundred of these types of different tests all at once, or you know the 25 that are on your, uh, on your, your what's that thing called? That the handy visual verification guide. Yeah, but that technology, what's that called? <laughs> What's that now? Uh, that technology is amazing. It's got a great display. <laughs> Very portable. Um, that's, i got to talk to you about that afterward. But uh, uh -huh. I think it is possible to do, and you know, with uh, the, the, the underlying technology that we set up for, for Verified Pixel, uh, is a, a tool that we developed called Superdesk. Um, and Superdesk does a lot of different things in a newsroom, but one of the things that it does in this, in this context is that it's almost like a switchboard, like an old school like switchboard where operators are able to make different connections between these different services. So yeah, I think that uh, this, the underpinning technology is there. Um, we just need to uh, get more organizations involved in this process. Did you um, yeah, I, ju I just reiterate what Doug said there. I mean, the biggest chat, I'm not a computer guy at all. I'm a newsroom guy and com you know, I switch on a computer and that's it. I expect it to work. Um, the biggest challenge, arguments, discussions, however you want to phrase it, we had wasn't about getting the information back. We could get all the information back we wanted. The challenge every time was me as a journalist, as someone who worked in newsrooms and Doug's coders as computer people saying, well, we've got all this information. How do we present that to the newsroom? And that was the kind of the biggest, longest, hardest discussions we had. It's, you know, well, do we use, not belittling traffic lights, but do we use traffic lights, you know? Wh and what does it mean, and how would we use a traffic light, right? So if, if we ask Google, does it, have you seen this picture before? And Google says, no, is that a green? Is that, yes, use it, go ahead? No, because uh, it doesn't mean it's not an original picture because it could have just been sitting on a SD card somewhere for five years, and then somebody got it out and then put it on the internet. So understanding, number one, what, how the tools work, and number two, presenting the results in a way that any, anybody and everybody can understand them was actually the hardest part of this whole challenge. And I think going forward, it is always about how do you present the results uh, in, a, in a way that is useful for journalists to then make a decision. Um, I'm interested to bring Mark back in, actually, and then, um, Jochen, I've got some questions for you about your experiences with newsrooms. But um, from the fact-checking perspective, this idea of an, an alert that comes up for the viewer mid-presidential kind of speech um, is, is obviously brilliant. But in terms of prioritizing, is it accuracy or speed or a, a combination of, of well, the everything? Cha the challenge for fact-checkers is that it's a competition between the need for accuracy and speed. Um, speed can be the enemy of accuracy, and yet uh, being slow can allow misinformation to, to go very quickly. So one of the reasons that so many of the journalists in the fact-checking community are interested in automating portions of the process or augmenting parts of the process with technology is to accelerate the process of identifying and verifying claims um, and to, to give us a leg up in that, in that competition. Uh, every, every moment it, of delay it takes us to get uh, a fact verified or proved right or wrong uh, is an opportunity for misinformation to take hold and spread further. And uh, so the closer to the point in time of origin we can get, the better. That, that's the ideal. But um, we would always rather be right than first. And, uh, and there are a lot of times where fact checkers now will, in the heat of a moment on a debate night in the United States, for example, hold off on fact checking a statement because it's not quite clear. And often, uh, as politicians get more familiar with the fact checking process, they realize that they can game it a bit by saying, things that are facty, but not necessarily factual, and, uh, and it makes it that much harder for it to be verified. There's an element of truth to it that makes it a harder call to make for the journalists. And um, so taking the time to really evaluate that statement and how it was constructed and was it um, crafted in a way to make it just true enough that it passes 
our kind of test. Um, our technology can help us with that, but it is still a very human and dangerous and precarious journalistic process. Um, Jochen, that reminds me that that, uh, that statement, just true enough, um, our colleague from, from um, Amnesty International, Christoph, who, who Jochen referenced earlier, who is very clear that not or just true enough isn't, it doesn't apply if you're dealing with human rights evidence, for example. So their, their process for verification, he would argue, is sometimes different to what we're facing in newsrooms. Um, Jochen, from the conversations you've had with newsrooms, what do you think are the biggest barriers to, to automating this? Can we ever trust the machine, which is the biggest question, which is probably going to shoot hands up in a moment. Well, uh, I personally think that also of talking to journalists, talking to media organizations, there will always, at least in the near future, there will always be a human element in it. Um, there will always be a human um, a person making that ultimate decision to publish something or not, to decide whether something will go out there or not. Because also somebody has to be responsible. Somebody has to be liable. But, or however, technology and automation can aid tremendously in that whole process. I mean, think of working practices at the moment. I mean, you, you know when, when you're doing ordinary fact-checking, I mean, just as every, every journalist does, and Jenny, you were, you, was, um, you were just referring to the W question, who, what, when, why, um, you want to check the source. So of course you can do that. If there's a piece of user-generated content or eyewitness media, should, you should investigate the source. So you can do that manually, and it takes quite some time. You can look at what are various sites like people, or who is, or directories, or Danic, or what, what have you. That all takes time, and you usually do one thing after another. Now imagine you have an automate, or automated process that does this in the background while you're accessing a tweet, a Facebook post, or whatever, that already does this source check that um, does an investigation what this person has done in the past that comes to some clues as to how likely it is that this person is a bot or a, a human being or so that can speed up the process considerably so you don't waste so much time um, on investing and, and, and especially in breaking news situations time is just very important. Um, then you can also um, look at individual pieces or individual verification tasks, like I mean, we've had that earlier with the images or so. If you can have a tool that assists you in verifying an image or falsifying an image, um, of course that is, um, or it can be, of great help. Um, and again, there's tools out there, they have been mentioned before, Google reverse image searches, um, TinEye and so on, but it takes time to operate them. Imagine having one platform that does all that, that brings all that together, because if you, um, if you look over the shoulder of journalists that are dealing with user-generated content or eyewitness media, they usually have 25 tabs open, t 25 browser tabs, and they go to one after another. So if you could combine all that into one platform where parts of the process that are done manually or also automatically, but one after another, if that could happen in parallel, that would be a huge benefit for the working process, for the speed, and for getting to the conclusion, which is currently reached one after another, so quite slowly. And when we're, when we're talking about automation, um, I think we should also consider not only um, individual components or tasks, as has been mentioned, for example, verifying or falsifying an, an image, but also think of related tasks um, in the process of verifying content. Think of translation, uh, translation tools. Um, there's so much content coming out of the Arabic world, Syria in particular. I don't think too many of us here are speaking Arabic or other languages or so. So having um, an automation like a translation tool that is providing accurate, reliable results and also is taking sort of particularities into account can be hugely beneficial. So that is also automation. So that's part of the verification process. It just goes, yeah, m it involves like getting deeper to the fact and investigating what is out there, taking clues and using technology to the best of its advantage, but not relying on it, not just completely relying on it. And at the end, make an informed decision, should I, should I having considered all the information I gathered, and then make an informed decision based on the facts I've accumulated to publish something or not. So that's, I think, currently state of affairs, but there can be a lot of aids and support and yeah, as we said earlier, or presented um, in what I said and the others as well, technology can aid tremendously, but it's not the holy grail that will do it all. So journalists will still play a role 
in the foreseeable future. Um, this seems like a good opportunity to hear what you all think, actually, because um, amongst this panel, there is a, I think, 3-2 tipped towards the fact that verification will always need a human element. Uh, it can inform decisions. It can't categorically, you know, give an accurate yes or no. Could we have maybe a show of hands who, for people who think the opposite of that, so people who believe that this is the start of actually you know, being able to automate the verification process. So it's one click on your desktop to say, is this image genuine? Would you believe the re would you ever believe the result that came back? Who would? Can I just make sure that everybody who didn't put their hand up is a wouldn't, or are you all undecided? How, how many wouldn't trust an image, w trust a... Machine. That's interesting. <laughs> so about 30 people undecided, <laughs> uh, which, you know, I think it's, that's why it's good to have the discussion. Is there anyone who'd like to comment further on why you feel that way? I can comment on that, actually. I'm in the tech sector for 15 years, and I mean, um, pattern recognition, that's about. And uh, the point is, uh, it's for sure it will happen. The question is only when. And... Uh, it takes a long period of time in regard to video uh, imagery detection automatic. We are at the beginning uh, in regard to pattern recognition, in regard to uh, co in the context of pictures. We are advanced as we have seen faces and much, much more. Uh, but I can't tell when this will happen. It's, uh, it's certain it will happen. It's in the foreseeable future over the next few years. That's it. Doug, do you want to say anything about that since you're in the four camp? Uh, yeah, I, th I think it's possible. I think that but the, the difference is, I mean, uh, being in Perugia, last night I ate at a, a restaurant that was very much involved in the slow food movement. Um, you know, we have, uh, you know, they're in the slow food, you, know, you have slow food versus fast food, right? I mean, what comes from a slow food restaurant is going to be very artisanal, it's going to be made with great care. Uh, but it's not going to be like McDonald's. But on the other hand, the amount of scale that you can achieve with McDonald's, it may not be completely perfect, but it's at least going to get you there, right? It's going to do a certain job. Now, a good example right now would be with Google Translate, right? Um, yeah, I'm a, you know, I, I also work as a translator. And probably I would say that Google Translate, at least from the language pairs that I use, is maybe 70% of, you know, 70% is accurate. But usually that's good enough at least to get a, an initial idea of something. And I think that that's closer to where we are, that uh, we may not ever get to something completely perfect, but at least it's going to be good enough for certain pr purposes. Thank you. Um, who in the room, who, who's terrified by that statement that good enough might take over? Gentlemen just here. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, go ahead with your question, then we'll, we'll come back. Um, no, I was just going to expand on that a little. Um, so I'm the automation editor at the Associated Press. Um, and I think it really depends on context. I think these systems, you know, getting to your good enough point, I think these systems would provide me a certain level of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? A certain level of confidence for more mundane situations, but for things where there's a lot of nuance or there's a particularly unique event or there's legal significance, right? What if we're translating a prime minister's admission of legal guilt? Um, you know, there is a lot of nuance in the language involved in those things, and that's something you're absolutely going to want to double check. You might get a, hey, I'm 95% sure that this guy said he was guilty, but you're going to want a human to double check that. And I don't think there's any way around that in certain situations. I agree. If we could have the microphone to the next question. Does anybody want to respond to that? I, I, you know, I, I do because I'm paying close attention to the work that the Associated Press is doing with automated insights on business coverage, for example, and their uh, ability to take financial filings and generate uh, stories using that technology from, from a really interesting company also in Durham, North Carolina. Um, but um, you, you imagine in the world of, say, fact-checking, and the Associated Press is one of the news organizations on that map that does an excellent job of fact-checking, and you might be able to identify a claim 
that is clearly about unemployment and clearly about a period of time. And the statement may be a little too nuancy to fact check automatically, but you can at least associate information that you know is correct about those parameters somewhat automatically with that to say, unemployment last year did this, or unemployment in this state or in this country did this. And being able to pair that automatically with a statement from a politician is, it may not be quite fact checking proper in terms of declaring, you know, coming to a reported conclusion, which is a very important aspect of the fact checking process for most fact checking news organizations, but it gets the reader pretty quickly to information that it, we could feel confident is reliable and may speak to the veracity of the statement, even if it can't answer the question in a definitive way right then. Thank you. So another question just here. Hello, Ruben Baumeister, Deutsche Welle. Um, Doc, I was actually gonna um, reply to, to your statement because I think that what you've said is actually exactly what Jochen said, is that we can't do it all automatically, right? So we can do verification clues, I think. We can see whether an image has been tampered or not, whether some facts might be right or not. But we still need this person that actually um, puts all of that together. And a clear uh, example is always context, for example. Uh, mm -hmm. Two weeks ago, we saw Brussels. We saw all kinds of old videos. Um, but the journalist actually had to put the context together, right? So I'm all automation, I'm all for automation, I must say, but, um, but we will always need journalists for that. Yeah, go ahead. No, no. I, was, I was gonna say as well that, uh, I mean, we, one of the goals that we had with, with Verified Pixel uh, was to make verification as easy as not verifying. Um, because really, one of the things that we see as being a big danger right now is that uh, it's super easy just to hit retweet. It's super easy to hit share. Um, and until these tools make it as easy to, to verify things as it is to, to share them, we're still gonna run into a lot of the same problems that we've got. And that I think is something that can be assisted now. Um, I also think that what's, us what's really interesting is that we're only, for the past few years, we've only started to really build processes around verification in, you know, in, a, in a really systematic way. Um, the example, you know, again, to go back to the food metaphor, right? Uh, my grandmother can cook a, a, di a dish, uh, you know, using just her memory. But on the other hand, when I have a recipe, I can replicate those steps every single time. And that making things replicable and scalable is, I think, a really important aspect of this work. Yeah, just to add to that, I mean, context is very important. I mean, if we look at or the, some of the examples we had, spotting um, or using an algorithm to um, spot a manipulation is getting easier and easier, especially with sophisticated image tools. Um, but at the, at the moment, lots of the images or videos that are circulating haven't been manipulated, they've just, they've just been taken out of context. And Brussels was just one example um, where uh, media organizations, reputed media organizations, were publishing, posting videos that were clearly not from Brussels, that were taken by surveillance cameras in Minsk and in Moscow and so on. So there's no, or in most, uh, many of them, there was no man manipulations whatsoever but they, they were taken out of context, taken from two, three, or four years previously. So if you have a sophisticated algorithm and these, these images, these videos had been accessible somehow, ideally they would also spot them very quickly and say, look, nothing manipulated, but taken out of context, they have been published and um, recorded some years previously. Um, um, okay, right. uh, let Alice, look, you, you go. Um, and then I think also, James, did you have a question? Or is it, has it been answered? No? Okay. Hi, um, Alistair Reid from First Draft. Um, we talked a little bit about video ver verification there, but that's still the big problem because you can't do a reverse video search because there's 24 images every second um, and there's no metadata. So what parts of it at the moment can you automate and can make video verification easier? And what steps towards new tools 
I know with Invid, I mean, we, we talked a little bit about this, but where is that going in terms of being able to make video verification easier for people? No one wants to talk about video <laughs> verification. <laughs> um, we've talked about it before, so just to share it with everybody, it is, as you say, a huge, huge challenge with video. Like I say, 24 frames per second, so it requires huge pro processing powers, databases so, so to store and then to compare, pair the data or the images. So, so. so to give you an honest answer, I don't know when we will have solutions that are as easy as sort of reverse image, image searches. I mean, there's promising attempts, and we are hoping to contribute to that. We've still got in, uh, in our project over two and a half years, and we're working together with a company called um, Exomachina that is providing a tool called um, um, Tungsten. And just to give you an idea of the scale, it's th this is really rocket science, um, and it's sort of yeah, sort of high art of um, image manipulation spotting. And they sell this tool. Um, and this tool costs a decent five digits sum in euros. And with the tool, with the software, comes a training course because they say you need, or a journalist or whoever uses it, needs at least one week's training to be sort of in a position to understand the output of it. Um, now think that, or transfer that to video, that's sort of adding a certain dimension of making it even more complicated. So the one of my, of my or worries, or we also talked about that um, before we came up here, is that even if there was a sophisticated tool out there, that it would be very expensive, and um, a large part of the sort of community who would like to use it wouldn't get access to it because of a price barrier. So this is also something to have in mind, that we work on tools that are accessible and usable for a wide community, because otherwise only a very few people, and in this case, especially video verification or video analysis, it's pr gonna be pro probably primarily law enforcement agencies, but not your journalist. So it's, I know it's not a proper answer, but sort of just pointing in some direction. If I can just build, build on that slightly, I mean, I think there's a couple of issues around video verification that really need to be addressed by the social media companies themselves. I mean, I think the fact that you know, every piece of metadata is stripped out of a piece of content when it's uploaded is a problem. It just seems to be a, to me anyway, and others may disagree, it just seems to be a solution that, you know, the easy solution, whereas I'm sure there's other ways. And, and if you look at uh, what Witness recently did working with YouTube to build the facial blurring tool, you know, that was a pressure from the human rights community saying we need this to protect the identity of people who are, who are witnessing human rights violations so we can actually report on the world. And YouTube took this up and ran with Witness and built it. Now, surely there must be a way to work on video verification with YouTube and the other social media network companies that protects the privacy of people who are uploading, protects the safety of people who are uploading, protects the wishes of people who are uploading, yet helps us actually verify a piece of video. Um, I don't know how we do that. I don't know how we talk to them yet, uh, but I think it's a conversation that needs to be had. Uh, another couple of tools which I think are out there which are very good for video verification has been built, again, in the human rights community. Uh, the International Bar Association have launched an app called Eyewitness to Atrocities, uh, which stores the metadata of the video, and as you're filming the video or taking a photograph, uploads it to their server, hides the video on your camera, if you're, you know, this is extreme atrocity witnessing, um, and then it allows you to, to do verification back in the home base with either your activist on the ground or your person on the ground. Problem there, of course, is apps, you know, when, when an event happens, no one just suddenly thinks, oh, I'll download the Eye Eyewitness to Atrocities app, you know, from the International Bar Association. Of course, they're gonna use their camera phone and use it on YouTube. So I think there is a lot to be done. I think there's a lot more that can be done. I'd like to see the social media companies open their doors more to actually talking to verifiers about video verification because you know at the moment it seems to be us pushing us talking us finding ways around rather than cooperating with so. and just also just one brief addition one problem in the context is also um, when you have videos that are shared that are obviously taken out of context what happens to them they're very quickly taken down again so ideally all these videos that are out there would be somehow stored forever and ever because 
at the moment, it's up to the journalist or the, to the human rights worker, it should be to store it, to tag it, to bring it into context with other information al around the event, because otherwise, when you want to reference back to it, it uh, an hour or two, hour, two days later, often it's gone, and that's adding additional problems. Probably more for the benefit of everyone on the panel. We've, we've got a bit of an early finish. We've, we've been asked to finish a bit early. So we've got about 10 minutes left. Um, also, there's uh, so many hands going up in the room. So I think we were going to end on even more controversial topics, particularly the ethics of gathering data through these tools. What we'll have to do is pitch for automating verification too at Perugia next year, because uh, that in itself will probably take an hour. Um, I'd really like to hear from all of you. I think it, it feels appropriate. So um, if you don't mind just taking the microphone to perhaps this chap again. Hi, um, Nick Diakopoulos at the University of Maryland. Um, I, I'm wondering if one of the challenges toward moving toward a, a sort of fully automated approach to verification is that we're kind of setting ourselves up for an arms race, right? I mean, we're, we're gonna be building technologies that help us verify content, but then people who don't want us to know that you know, their content has been doctored are gonna you know, design and engineer other algorithms that can mask and um, subvert our capability to verify that. So I'm reminded of um, the Google DeepMind system, right, that, w that can look at an image and tell you that it's uh, uh, a certain type of flower or a gorilla or something like that. Um, and the, there are some blogs out there that were actually introducing noise into the flower image. And so the flower image looks like a flower. You can't tell uh, that it's anything but a flower. But to the DeepMind algorithm, They've introduced just the right flavor of noise to make the DeepMind algorithm think it's something ridiculous, like you know a wrench or something something else that would w that would throw you off. <laughs> so I mean, you're gonna you're gonna hit situations like this where you have back bad actors who are who want to manipulate the media and have the technical capability to kind of thwart the technologies that you're implementing. And I'm just wondering, you know, I, I guess. Maybe I'm I, I'm proposing this is this is going to be an eternal struggle for us. I think anything with the, with the words deep mind algorithm needs to be answered by Doug. Um, and actually, we, we we did talk about covering the the sort of growth of as the verification technology improves, so does the technology that we're fighting against. You know, the the bots fighting the bots, as it were. So maybe Doug's got more to add on that. Well, uh, the first thing is that you know you try to make something idiot proof, and they just keep coming up with better idiots and. Uh, so there is going to be an arms race. Um, you know, already you've seen, uh, we're seeing a number of activists, like there, uh, last year I think it was at uh, uh, the Transmediala Festival in Berlin, there were some activists that were doing some work with uh, uh, makeup, face makeup, that's designed to fool facial recognition uh, algorithms. Um, also you have uh, hoodies that are do, uh, trying to do the same thing. So. You know, yeah, there, y there are th going to be a lot of these different things, but that's still not uh, a reason not to try to do something now um, with what's, what's out there av available today to make this job of verification easier because it's so important. And in terms of the, the flood of, of what's coming in, I mean, Mark, you referenced this, that obviously it's just the sheer number. And how much of, are you seeing that's, that's automated kind of fakes? Well, and, and and the same trickery that could be applied to imagery can be applied to a political statement just as well. Um, one of, uh, you know, a lot of the computer scientists that we're collaborating with uh, are starting to point out things that we hadn't anticipated. So uh, there's a particularly good paper by some of our colleagues at Duke and University of Texas and Google called iCheck, Computationally Combating Lies, Damn Lies, and Statistics. And a lot of it, frankly, is in that category of algorithmic technicality that I don't understand, but there's a section that I really did understand, which was how the same technology could be reverse engineered to make better claims, that could to, to make factual statements that could uh, pass muster. So there are aspects of that that would be wonderful for politics. If, if political speech writers and spin meisters start realizing hey, if we could run our upcoming State of the Union address 
through the same technology that the fact checkers are using and we pass muster with this, great, you know? And, and maybe that makes politics more truthy and yet it also sort of creates opportunities for manipulation. And the fact that the people we're working with are anticipating that and pointing that out to us proves that technology can be helpful but it isn't always the answer. It's often the beginning of the next problem. Um, of course. Just to, just to Nick's point there. Um, I, think, I think there's, yes, I think there's a lot of manipulation that goes on. I think if we bring it, boil it down to breaking news, however, it's very rare, certainly in my experience, some might disagree, it's very rare for us to see r truly manipulated pictures in a breaking news event. What you see is mit misattribution. So you see, and most of that is actually done not by badly intentioned people. It's the people like standing at the bus going, oh my God, retweet. Oh, you've just retweeted a picture from Minsk, not from Brussels. So I think that's where automation truly, truly can help us. And I love, you know, Mark's idea before, and I was just thinking, you know, looking at Joanna, he's like, you know, if we could have something in Twitter was as you go about to retweet, you, it was like, you know, that's from Pakistan, from the Rugby World Cup in 2007, not from Paris this week, don't you? question mark. Um, you know, I think that could actually tru truly, truly help us because I don't think we see much true manipulation in the immediate aftermath of a breaking news event, really. And then on the, on the other hand, though, the dystopian future would have a version of Clippy going, are you sure? Are you sure? Are you sure? Are you sure? Um, can we have the microphone? We have a couple more questions. I think just lady here at the end of the row. Can I just have a show of hands of how many more we have to try and squeeze in? One more, two more. Great, let's go. Hi, um, I was wondering, this misattribution thing comes up time and time again for video verification. I was wondering how much of it is a data problem. Um, so, I'm rem humor me for a bit, I'm reminded of Google cars. Um, driverless cars have come a very long way in the past few years and that's not because the technology is any better, but because Google have all the street view data. And actually, it's a much easier problem for uh, the cars to go, this is a, la a lamp, not lamp, it's traffic light, uh, instead of swerving around it, I can just tell if it's red or green, right? That's an easier computational problem than figuring out what it is. Um, is it the same for verifying video? Um, if you had data around what Brussels looks like in terms of its buildings and in terms of its, like, I don't know, furniture around the city, and that was open data, would it be easier to, like, link into that? So that's my roundabout question. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Bellingcat has done a lot of very interesting work in that area. Um, a lot of the work, and you can see even a lot of the, uh, uh, they have these great tutorials on the Bellingcat website about how to verify things simply based on the surrounding uh, uh, imagery. You can use Google Street View, you can use uh, Paris, uh, what is it called, Panoramio. Um, you, you can use a lot of these different tools to, to see, where, you know, to triangulate where something was, was shot from. Um, and yeah, that can definitely help. Automating that would be really nice. I'm just gonna rush ahead uh, with the question at the back. Yeah. And I think we're, we're gonna be evicted. Um, <coughs> yeah, uh, hi, I'm Giovanni Battista Carlos from the Nexus Center from Internet Society. Being a lawyer, I just put it in a slightly different perspective. And so liability. Uh, I was uh, fact checking is the mo one of the most typical defense on a defamation liability. Just say, oh, I checked it everything correctly. And at the present time, I think that presenting the judge, I use an automated tool, the best automated tool possible. I don't think he will he will buy it as a good defense. While on the other hand, maybe in the next future, you could be held liable because of the fact that you didn't use an automated tool which would have spotted the forgery, for instance. So do you think that would, is, is it a foreseeable um, for a for a cyber future, and then the second question, very very fast. Uh, all those uh, uh, all those tools remind me of all the issues we have with digital forensics tools. Uh, do the uh, two worlds talk uh, talk of this issue? Are they interconnected? Sam, you had a, a whole work, uh, workshop about this last year, right? About uh, in the human rights field, uh, evidentiary versus uh, advocacy in evidentiary work versus advocacy work in the human rights field. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot of work being done. You know, um, there's a great project at Carnegie Mellon University called ELAMP, uh, which is doing exactly that. It's 
scaling down, scaling, scaling huge swathes of video from Syria, uh, and then using computer learning to actually pick out you know, what it's seeing as being human rights violations. Problem, two problems, I think, in the human rights sphere, certainly, uh, on this scaling is, number one, training a judge <laughs> to understand that this should be ac accepted in court. And, uh, you know, a lot of the judges just really don't understand that social media content is actually evidence. Uh, and number two is, yeah, the evidentiary requirement is so high uh, that really, you know, you have to be on the ground actually doing interviews as well to back up what you have in front of you. So I think there's problems. I think where it, is, where, where it truly helps is on the scalability. So all the content you've got from Syria, and you know, going through swathes and swathes and swathes of it, it's gonna take years and years and years. So actually that, that scalability of automating, automation helping with the scalability is, is gonna be crucial. And I'd also add as another plug, which feels like that's all I'm here for, shamelessly plugging um, ourselves and other sessions, but we've actually got a copyright workshop on Saturday um, where we're going to be addressing the crossover here because actually if you haven't been able to identify the source of an image, you shouldn't be using it anyway. So, you know, th there, are, there are implications and, and the layers of this, you know, complexity. As we start looking into automation, we need to be embedding ethical codes from the beginning. We need to be embedding kind of legal considerations also. So, um, so yeah, more conversations to be had on that. Final plug. Um, my colleagues from the First Draft Coalition are about to start, I think, at 6 o'clock, a verification tools and techniques workshop. Craig Silverman from Emergent uh, and BuzzFeed and Josh Stearns um, are going to be walking through some of the techniques that we cover in the guide. So any of you who want more practical advice on how to do it until the machines do take over, um, please go to that. And they will. Um, and then it just remains for me to say thank you so much. It's been really inspiring to hear all of these projects. Thank you all for participating and enjoy the rest of your day.